Welcome everyone. My name is Corinne and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Simos, an implant restorative and cosmetic dentist as our speaker tonight for a discussion regarding current indirect restorative strategies and methods related to impression techniques, including intraoral scanning, retraction strategies, and adhesives and bonding strategies. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled have a question on your console and we will answer them live at the end. This webinar is sponsored by Dent Supply Serona and Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Doctor, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it on over to you. Welcome to New Rules of Indirect Restorations. I'd like to thank Henry Schein for inviting me to speak today, and a special thanks to Densply Serona for sponsoring me today. And although Densply is paying me an honorarium to speak today, the materials you see in this presentation are the materials I use in my practice every day. My name is Dr. Sam Simos. I practice in Bolingbrook, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. For the past 25 years, I've had the privileged to work with most of the major dental manufacturers in research and development as a clinical instructor, a key opinion leader, author, and lecturer. I've had the opportunity to take all of this knowledge and bring it back what I and bring back what I've learned to my patients. And for the last 30 years have delivered the finest dentistry to the finest people in the world. Truly, there's never been a better time to be a dentist. Today, more than ever, we have the ability to offer superior materials, technology, and clinical options to our patients like never before. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is an example of just that. Digital interoral scanning, where we can actually take a scan of the patient right away in real time what you're seeing is the IntelliScan 3D. Uh, there are many good scanners on the market that are very, very adequate. Uh, we use this in our practice. We use two or three different uh, scanners in our practice, but the hygienist can use this, the assistant can use this to really communicate with our patients. And we can offer fantastic dentistry unlike any time before in history. We can offer one day night guards, our hygienist can take a scan and print, 3D print a night guard and have it ready before the patient leaves their hygiene appointment. We can offer one day clear aligners, two appointment dentures, two appointment dentures, it's amazing. Of course, I said 3D printing, one day surgical guides, instant treatment plan reports with QR code, we can actually present a treatment plan, generate a QR code, and that patient can show their significant that night or that next day a, the same presentation that we gave in the office. Within seconds, we can generate all of this. Not only the treatment plan, but also the QR code. And we have instant communication with the lab. They can communicate with us. We can communicate with them. Um, and improved hygiene communication. You know, our hygienists can now scan the patient in real time and show the patient. The patients are, are amazed at what they're seeing on the screen. And what you're seeing here is an example of an impression that we're taking digitally. And right away, we can see if we have enough clearance, we can see the margin, we can see the uh, occlusion and uh, everything else. So it's a wonderful technology and I really encourage you all to check it out and, um, you know, uh, incorporate this into your practice. You'll be glad you did. So today's focus uh, will be on the new rules of the indirect restoration. And the average clinician out there, and I know none of you are average, so none of you are, are asking this, but the average dentist out there will ask, well, you know, what are the new rules of restoration? They're the same as they always have been. But we're going to talk today about three major things, the prep, the scan, and the bond. So why has the prep design changed? We're going to talk a little bit about what the literature review says and that most failures happen because of prep design. And we need to understand the goal of prep design and the end result before you begin so that you can set up an easy scan or impression. 
The next thing we're going to talk about is how to take a great scan. Or if most of you and some of you are still doing uh, analog impressions, that's fine. Uh, we're going to, it's the, the same rules apply. If you can scan it, you can definitely take an impression of it. But it's very important that you stick with some strategies and some rules and protocols uh, that you adhere to every time you scan or take an analog impression. And the next thing we're going to talk about is the substrate. We need to understand your choice of cements or bonds. You know, most people think that, well, if I prepped everything now, I just need to know what cement to use. But that's not true. We have to understand the clinical situation. We have to understand the substrate and the micro gap and how all of that, uh, along with the preparation, plays a role in the success of your case. And then we need to understand and review the proper protocol for zirconia and lithium desilicate placement. So often I'll be lecturing and I get three or four dentists that are telling me, um, gosh, Sam, I just have, I'm having so much problem with my, with my zirconia debonding and I'm getting so many um, debondings happening. You know, there's got to be something wrong with this zirconia uh, or the cements that I'm using. And the, and the reality is there's not. We just need to understand the, the, the process better, okay? And so I'm hoping that with all of this lecture, uh, you will all – uh, hopefully get something out of it, at least one tidbit, one golden nugget, and you can take it home and start uh, using it in your practice. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about this, this thing about preparations, right, and substrates and micro gaps and how it all works together. So in the preparation, we're just going to say a couple of things. One, you know, we have a retentive and non-retentive preparations, right? No one would ever question that you need to bond a veneer preparation, right? It's not retentive. You need to bond that. And then, and that's the, the, the picture on the left. And we have a retentive posterior preparation on the right, and that's a, um, a, a, a crown, right? And so nobody, this is where we come into some question, right? The question is, well, do I bond it or do I cement it? And I would say that 90% of the clinicians out there are going to use a resin modified glass ionomer cement and put it on. It's fast. It's easy. But is that really the best material to use in every situation? And I would say that hopefully after this program, you're going to question whether or not that's the best material to use uh, all of the time. You need to have more things in your armament, more materials in your armamentarium for the different um, clinical situations that you arrive at. Okay. Everyone has, we, we've all cemented 10 crowns a day, right? But every one of those crowns are different in different clinical situations. The next thing we're going to talk about are substrates. Well, the new rules of indirect restorations really have to do the, a good amount with substrates. You know, no longer are, do we have PFM and gold that we only have to deal with and we can just glue those in. Now we have lithium desilicate that has about, we have about 95% of the market. Zirconia and lithium desilicate is a much different animal than uh, metal, okay? It's not conforming to the tooth as well. There's a micro gap that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, they both bond to the teeth differently. Uh, zirconia and lithium desilicate bond to the tooth differently. So we have to understand what substrate what we're doing here in, in the, in the zirconia and lithium desilicate realm. We also have to worry about micro gaps today because no longer are we using uh, metal or PFMs or gold that would adhere and, and, and form to the tooth really, really well. The micro gap in a metal crown is very, very small. But when you get into the zirconia and lithium desilicate, the micro gap grows. And we're going to talk about why that is an issue. And so when you start putting all of this together, preparation, substrates, micro gaps, the literature will tell you that you have to really question now whether or not you should bond or whether you should cement. There's a big difference between bonding and cementing in different clinical situations. A lot of times you can get away with cementing uh, your restorations in uh, the right clinical situation, but not always. We have to turn to bonding our posterior restorations uh, a lot of the time. So let's get into this and talk about this. Uh, the, I, we've talked about the micro gap a little bit. 
Um, we'll get into that, the, what the literature says about this more. But, you know, we don't really have an easy job anymore. The preparations have changed. No longer are we, um, you know, for those new clinicians, we're not um, prepping on typodont teeth. We have fractures that come into our office that we have to really understand how we're going to strategize in prepping these teeth, right? Um, we have old fillings that really have, take up a good majority of the tooth and then the decay, you know, will, will eat up more of the, of the majority of the clinical crown. And then they, they go subgingively. We really have to understand how we're going to tackle this, uh, this preparation. You know, it's not going to be ideal, and we have to understand what the goal of the preparation is before we begin. How about restorations that we're replacing because of reoccurring decay? Uh, there are a lot of those that we have out there now, right? We're going to approach these preparations much differently than if we were to have just a virgin tooth. How about restorations that we have to make because uh, we have some reoccurring decay in an already prepared tooth? Again, same situation. It's going to be very difficult. We have to understand how to deal with the tissue, how to deal with the, the, the tooth itself, and, um, and what materials to use. And then we just have old, old, um, old restorations that we need to, large restorations that we need to deal with. But it's really the tooth underneath that we need to understand how we're going to, what's the goal of our preparation? What do we need to know? How do we need to prepare these teeth that are already pretty compromised. So if you don't understand the goal, you'll never achieve success. Okay. So we all understand we don't have an easy job, but it's a job that we've elected to do and we have to get in there and we do it every day, right? So what is the what does the research say? What do what do they why do crowns fail? Why do they come off? And so many uh, articles and papers are out there that why crowns fail. And so I broke it down and um, really I, I kind of congealed everything. And here are the reasons why crowns, why the, the, the consensus among the studies say that crowns fail. Horizontal and vertical point loading forces are best along the long axis of the tooth. That would be great. So the forces are a big issue with our, with our preparations and our crowns coming off. We don't just bite up and down along the long axis of our tooth in a posterior restoration. It looks more like an ellipse, right? More of this circular kind of pattern where we're kind of uh, going at the tooth and, and hitting it on an angle most of the time when we're occluding between the top and the bottom teeth. So forces are a big reason why um, crowns fail. The other is taper versus height. We're not quite understanding in the, our failed crowns that the preparation is a big reason why the crown fails. The lesser preparation taper of 10 degrees is more favorable than 30 degrees. And, and we want to decrease our taper as the height increases on our prep. So we're going to look at this and we're going to talk about, you know, what the proper angulation of your walls are versus the height. And then what you should do, because, you know, because we're dealing with so much redo dentistry out there, like you saw in the previous slide, we're not always going to get an ideal prep, right? We have to understand why and how to bond our restorations into these uh, less than favorable preparations that we have. And then we have to deal with the tissue because we can't bond in a wet environment. So we're going to talk about all of this. And this is the whole reason that that you know, the game has changed, right? We have to understand each clinical situation is different. And then we're going to talk about crowns failing because of margin design. And, and you know, all you have to do is take a trip to your lab and walk around and look at the different lab pans, and you'll see that there are a number of chamfer designs out there. This is how we used to design a, a preparation for a gold crown, a chamfer. We didn't need a big shoulder. But now with the lithium desilicates, uh, you need a good shoulder to um, decrease the micro gap and have less stress uh, in that marginal area. It's a very important area in that micro gap. So we have to really understand margin design when we're dealing with these, um, these preparations and where we're placing the margin as well is very, very important. We'd like to be above the gum line. 
Um, but sometimes, and a lot of times, because of old dentistry, we have to go subgingival and, and reoccurring decay. So let's take a closer look at our prep design and talk a little bit about these strategies and really understand the goal of what it is that we're doing when we're talking about um, you know, prep design and, and, and what the foundation is of the success that we're going to have. So when we look at prep design and prep taper, it's always better to be 12 degrees or less of a taper, a very straight wall, right? And we want to have three to four millimeters of prep height from the margin to the occlusal surface of the, of the finished crown prep. So the retentive crown prep will be in this 12, eight to 12 degrees and three to four degrees height, okay? So a good visual of this is are these pictures here? We've got two very um, tall and um, non-tapered crown preps, right? Um, and so these are, this is probably the best case scenario you can have when you're preparing a crown and when you're cementing a crown. They have very slight taper, and although the bottom uh, for the picture um, is short and narrow. Um, so long as the height is more than 40% of the width, you've got good resistance form and, and you're and to be achieved. And so this is what we're going for, right? This is the idea. We want to have those forces. Notice we're, we're looking at forces here and we want the force to resist, uh, and, um, and be, and we want these, these preparations to be retentive. And this is a retentive preparation right here. So no matter what, uh, cement we use. Um, I love Calibra Universal. I think it's a fast, easy uh, bonding. It's a self-adhesive resin cement. Fills the micro gap. Um, easy, easy cleanup. I also like Calibra Bio. Uh, Calibra Bio is an awesome cement that um, has some uh, bioactive capabilities. It's a hybrid between a glass ionomer and a ceramic cement. Uh, so we really can fill that micro gap and help heal that um, dentin. So if I'm having sensitivity, I'll use a Calibra Bio and when I've got a retentive prep. When we're dealing with a non-retentive prep, uh, we're dealing with a, a, a large taper or a short crown or both, right? So some examples of that are uh, this. Uh, we've got two to three millimeters in height and I would say that this is the really the the, the poster child for a non-retentive crown prep that you'll have in your in your in your office. Uh, I think that I see so many of these, the, 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 the clinician will question, well, why does this come off? It's really, it's really retentive, but the problem is it's short, right? And so it, it has a minimal taper, but it's short. And so you cannot resist the forces. Um, the resistance of the force is not, is not, is not enough. So you'll always get that crown popping off. And in this case, again, I, I, I turn to a bonded uh, restoration. I turn to either Calibra Universal or Calibra Ceram, which I believe is the five-star um, cement uh, for bonding um, a non-retentive crown. And then you have another type of non-retentive crown. You might be very tall, but the 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 walls of the preparation are just too uh, converging. It's just too slanted. This is my ice cream cone prep, and I really want to avoid this at all costs. Um, uh, this is this is just a, a nightmare because uh, unless you're going to bond this tooth in, even if you bond it, you really have to watch the occlusal forces on this kind of a preparation because it will always uh, the resistance is not there for the occlusal forces. Okay, so these are the different kinds of retention that you want to watch for when you're um, when you're preparing your crowns. And when you're designing your preparations, you have to understand what it is you're going to end up with. And then that's going to set up the strategy for the cementation. So why bond? Well, why bond? Because we have so many, um, we, we don't have an ideal situation usually in a clinical situation. Um, we're not always going to have a, um, a retentive crown that we can put on. We have to understand the micro gap with this materials that we're using. We have to fill those micro gaps. It's getting better with lithium to silicate and, and zirconia, but it's just, it's just pretty large right now with lithium to silicate and zirconia. So we have to understand that and be mindful of that. So in my practice, you know, I will do some 
resin reinforced glass ionomer cementing, but the majority of my crowns, whether they're retentive or non-retentive, will be bonded, okay? Whether they're lithium disilicate or zirconia. All right, so let's talk about um, the problems. Um, the, the literature is very clear here that um, we can no longer ignore the microgap. The microgap is, mo is the problem um, and let's talk about that a little bit. We want to explore this micro gap because I think that we've ignored it long enough and I don't think we can ignore it anymore. The micro gap can be the cause for microbial leakage and ultimate failure of the crown, especially if you're not paying attention to how you're cementing or bonding subgingively. Definitely the micro gap in this situation, if you're using zirconia and you're not taking, you're not understanding that that, uh, that micro gap when you're using a resin reinforced glass ionomer cement, um, you will have longevity issues with your restoration. The, the, the literature is very clear with this and I've seen it clinically as well. Um, the goal is to decrease the micro gap and to fill that micro gap with cement that resists micro leakage over time. And for me, that's a, that's a resin bonded cement, okay? Uh, the strategy will evaluate that micro gap at the cementation and then um, try to minimize it, but use a re resin cement to fill that micro gap and resist the micro leakage. And, um, and I think you'll be um, in much better position. So we have to understand the differences in substrates. This is the biggest um, thing. And we have to understand that there's a, a correlation between failure and success with our preparations and our substrates. And we have to remember that the purpose of a traditional cement is to fill that micro gap between the crown and the tooth at the margin and underneath. And it's to assist in retention and resistance. It's not to create the re retention and resistance. Remember, the best cement cannot overcome a poorly designed preparation. That's the caution, right? So once we understand the correlation between the preparation and the uh, substrate, and then we can understand what cement to use. And we're going to talk a little bit about what cement to use and how to use it a little later on in the program. But let's talk a little bit about tissue management because uh, even the best cements, even the best preparation, if you don't have proper tissue management and fluid control, and I'm talking saliva and blood, you will not be able to properly bond or cement the crown um, adequately. So when we're talking about tissue management, we're talking about two different categories of tissue management, non-surgical and surgical. Okay, And the literature is very clear on this, that the non-surgical consists of cord and chemicals, okay? Now here are some of the most used cords and chemicals that we use today clinically. Uh, the cord is, is pretty easy. There are a lot of cords out there. Um, we also use cord in conjunction with um, this chemical astringent, right? The, it's the, most of these are vasoconstrictors, and so you get the hemostasis. Uh, and so, uh, so we mix these together. What's the, what's the, the chemistry here in an astringent, um, this is from Ultradent, uh, it's a 20% ferric sulfate. Now ferric sulfate, we have to be careful because again, we are, we bond dentists bond, whether or not you're bonding a buildup, whether or not you're bonding, we, we just bond. That's all we need to. And so if we're preparing and we're having to add, we're having to, to have tissue management and we're having to add a buildup. We don't really want to use ferric sulfate because ferric sulfate will interfere with the bond um, integrity. So we want to, um, I, in my practice, I only use ferric sulfate when I absolutely have to. I really want to use aluminum chloride and I'll, I, I, I pretty much use hemoban gel 99% of the time in my practice um, prep in, in prepping the crown along with the cord. I'll, I'll uh, saturate the cord with the hemoban gel. And the hemoban gel is a true gel. It's 25% aluminum chloride. And it's a nice uh, adjunct to the cord. And it's a, it's a great way to go to uh, retract 
the tissue with the cord and also get that hemostasis that, that we need. Now, uh, I like a product like Traxident. Um, it's from Premier. Um, also, I like um, uh, a retraction paste from Voco. There are a number of, of pastes that are out there um, that, uh, that you should look at and have in your armamentarium. I'm a true believer in having many things in your drawer that you can use in different clinical situations. Um, just because I use hemoband gel 90% of the time doesn't mean I don't use any of these other things. I have all of these things at my ready so that given the clinical situation, I can use, um, I can use, um, whatever. Okay. So, um, this is, this is what I, I will usually use is hemoband gel and a cord. Um, but then we have a surgical uh, choices too, right? We can use the diode laser, which I use extensively in my practice, and we can use electrosurge or rotary curatage is kind of the new, uh, electrosurge, uh, much gentler on the tissue. doesn't, um, transfer heat, all of that. So I'm a diode laser guy. I like, um, I, I love my diode laser. I use it all the time. I use it with every preparation that I that I have, I use it in in uh, implant placements. I use it. I use it all over the place. So my diode laser is is very important to me. You'll see a case here coming up next where we have tissue management, and we um, we we use a combination of of all of these. We use a diode laser. We use a little cord. We use a hemoband gel. We use a little traxident. So let's look at that. Here's a case where we have recurring decay underneath a post and core crown PFM. I had to remove that. And we found that the post was very, very solid. I didn't have to remove the post, but I had to go underneath the post in order to um, get more, uh, get the ferrule effect. I needed two to three millimeters of solid two structure below the buildup. And so I needed to get some, some, some tooth there. And you can see on the x-ray that I do have enough two structure available um, with the proper tissue management. So I used my laser and I got as much, um, exposure as I could. And, um, and then I, I needed some, some hemostasis because I needed to do some buildup on, around the crown. So I used the traxident and I, with the traxident, you push the traxident into the sulcus and then you, I, I used a, um, uh, a cotton, um, block that we had the patient bite down on for two minutes. Then once you open it up, you you really get um, some nice uh, hemostasis enough to where I don't have to worry about it bleeding while I'm building everything up. Okay, and so I'm uh, going ahead and using my phosphoric acid, doing an adhesive prime and bond elect, and then building up um, with a core buildup material. And then uh, notice how the hemostasis is really. Um, cooperating. There's no blood. There's no uh, fluid. Very, very easy. And at this point, we were doing all analog impressions, but we could definitely capture that subgingival um, margin very, very easily. Okay. So I think it's really important that you have a strategy, that you have the materials available to you chair side that you can choose no matter what clinical situation arises, you never know what clinical situation you're going to be in. You need these products available to you so that you can have them regardless of what you're doing on any given day. Okay, so um, that is um, tissue management and a little bit of it. Uh, the next we're going to talk about analog impressions. Okay, and whether or not you're doing analog or digital, you can we can all agree that these analog impressions really don't cut the mustard. These are actual impressions that were sent to the lab um, by a clinicians, um, and um, you can see there's no way that they could make these. Uh, these these impressions work, right? They, the lab could never make a restoration from these impressions. How about this one? I mean, the clinician clearly had no idea about the materials. They were struggling with the materials and whether or not an assistant took this or the clinician. It's really um, unfortunate that they would send something like this to the lab. We need to be very precise in what we're sending, whether it's scanned or whether it's an analog impression we need to make sure that what we're sending represents what we're doing, right? And what we want back. We can never expect something back that's that's five star unless we send a five star impression. So we need to, uh, if we're you doing a subgingival uh, impression, 
we need to make sure that the impression material can get there, that we have a dry field, and that um, everything is as good as can be. And then we need to use the best materials possible. Uh, I use Aquasil Ultra Plus. I use a light body and a heavy body when I'm doing an, an, um, an analog impression. I have that in my armamentarium. If I have to do a, a, an analog impression, I have it right now in my drawer. Uh, so I'm able to get to that. Um, and it's, it's the best quality that you could ever have in a, an impression material. I'm going to show you my technique. Uh, we showed you at the beginning about a digital scan. That's very easy. If you can see the prep and have proper tissue management, you can scan it. Um, this is what the, the technique that I use for a uh, analog impression. I, while I'm squeezing the uh, light body around the tooth, my assistant is putting the uh, heavy body on the tray. I will use a triple tray if I have one to two teeth per quadrant. Um, otherwise, I'm using a full arch tray. Uh, in this case, we're just doing one crown. And we're going ahead and we are having the patient bite into central occlusion. I make sure that I the tray fits before we put the, the, um, the material in and I make sure that I know what central occlusion looks like before we put the impression in. I'm not a huge believer in having my assistants take my impressions. I like to do it myself. Um, and so you see that this is a very easy, very quick, very, very clear impression. Uh, and you get that every time you want to have a strategy that you use chair side that is dependable and reproducible and using the best materials possible. So, um, so with that, um, let's talk about bonding protocol. And we're going to use the last 20 minutes or so here to talk about bonding protocol and understand that the, there are different protocols for zirconia and different protocols for lithium desilica. And you have to understand, and the literature is very, very clear here, that um, th there, there is a right and a wrong way to put in and, and treat a zirconia versus a lithium desilicate uh, crown. Okay, so... Understand that if you're having failures with your zirconia, it's probably because you're not treating the material correctly um, when or using the proper materials when you're putting this in. So hopefully this will clear up a lot of problems for anybody out there that's having issues. Uh, let's talk about the, the, the commonalities of how we treat zirconia and lithium desilicate uh, before we talk about the differences, okay? So the commonalities according to the literature, is this. Well, we want to remove the temp. And, and you're going to say, yes, yeah, Sam, of course. Uh, uh, you got to be a dummy if you're saying don't remove the temp. Well, of course, remove the temp, but we need to clean the cement from the prep. And uh, a lot of times uh, when we see bond failures, we'll see uh, temporary cement on the prep. We have to clean the preparation and understand that um, a not clean preparation will affect bonding um, bonding strengths dramatically. And then we need to control the bleeding. Whether we're working with zirconia, lithium desilicate, or composite for that matter, we need to control the bleeding when we're putting in uh, zirconia or lithium desilicate crown. So we want to use aluminum chloride, not ferric sulfate, regardless, because we're bonding, right? or we're cementing. We do not want to inhibit that bond strength, so we want to use aluminum chloride. The next thing we want to do is we want to clean the tooth, and we can clean the tooth or sandblast the tooth with chlorhexidine. And Ultradent has a great chlorhexidine scrub, um, and a lot of people I've found uh, through lecturing around the country that a lot of people don't have sandblasters in their office um, I would tell you that if you you're, if you don't use a sandblaster all the time, uh, don't use it intraorally. Just use it extraorally um, so that you can keep it easy. Uh, clean the tooth with a chlorhexidine scrub. And now we're and those are the commonalities, right? We need whether or not we're talking about zirconia or lithium desilicate bonding protocols. We need to do this for both lithium desilicate and zirconia. The next thing we're going to do is to talk about specifically zirconia. 
okay? And how do we do that? After everything is clean, what do we do to put this crown on? What do we need to do to zirconia that's different from lithium to silicate to put this crown on successfully? Well, how does the lab send you the crown? You have to understand that the lab will send you the crown 90% of the time sandblasted sandblasted. That's important, right? And it's important for you to have a sandblaster in your office um, so that if you have a debonded crown, you can sandblast the inside of that crown off and take all of the, um, all of the, 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 the bond or the cement that's, that's on that crown, you can take it and clean off that substrate. Okay. It's very important that you would, with a debonded crown, you need to sandblast the inside of that. Okay, and then the other thing you're going to do with zirconia is you're going to try it in and adjust at the time of try-in. Don't adjust and do your major adjustments at the time after cementation. You want to try in and adjust at try-in. Adjust at try-in. Do all of your major adjustments at try-in. And by the way, you should have very little adjustment. If you have a lot of major adjustments all the time, you need to talk to your lab about um, uh, why you're having this problem. Okay, so... Um, you shouldn't have a lot of major adjustments, but if you do, it's time to adjust the crown uh, at the time of try-in. You can do fine-tuning after, but minimize the amount of vibration while that material, that bond, that's, that resin cement is, um, is, is curing, okay? And then you want to clean the zirconia. Now, clean the zirconia. We're not talking about cleaning the tooth. We've already done that. You want to clean the zirconia. Now, you can use IvoClean, a uh, product from IvoClar. I use bleach in my office, just regular old off-the-shelf bleach, and um, I clean, after I try it in, I'll clean the underside with bleach, or I, I, sometimes I will sandblast the underside if it's a, if it's a, a, a bloody uh, situation. Um, but, but usually I will uh, just use bleach and clean everything up, okay? So that's, uh, that's the way I clean. Do not use on zirconia, phosphoric acid, or alcohol. That will inhibit the, inhibit the bond, okay? And then the next thing is you want to prime. And we're going to talk about priming a little bit later. But for zirconia, I will use a zirconia primer, the specific for zirconia. Um, there are a lot of primers out there that say you can use uh, pri the primer for both lithium to silicate and zirconia. And that's probably true. But I'm a believer that I'm kind of a purist. And I like to use a primer that's specific for, zir for zirconia. So I'll use Z Prime Plus. That's from Bisco. The next thing we're going to talk about is lithium to silicate protocol. We just talked about zir zirconia. Now we're talking about lithium to silicate, your Emaxes. Uh, there are different now um, names for all of these uh, lithium to silicates, but I'm going to use lithium to silicate as a general classification of um, crown substrate. So how does the lab send you back the lithium to silicate? Well, usually they'll send it back etched, not sandblasted, etched, right? Um, because this is an etchable porcelain. So they'll send it back etch. Now you should also have an etch in your office if you have debonds because you are going to have to clean the surfaces of these debonds if you ever have one um, and, and you'll really want to etch that back um, correctly. Uh, try in and adjust the uh, crown. Again, we want to do our major adjustments at try in, not after we've cemented. And then we want to clean the lithium to silicate. Now, this is very different than zirconia. You want to clean the lithium to silicate with IvoClean, alcohol, or phosphoric acid. Okay? That's important. That's a big difference. And then you want to prime lithium to silicate with a specific primer. I use silane, and I use a two-bottle silane system rather than a one-bottle silane system. If you're using a one-bottle silane system, that means that 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 um, it can hydrolyze if you keep it on the shelf. So your chemistry is not always fresh and it will minimize your bond strength. So what I want to do is have clear, uh, um, really good chemistry, fresh chemistry. So I'll use a silane that's in an A and B. Okay. So a bottle, so two different bottles. So it can't hydrolyze over, over time if it's on the shelf, if I'm not using it every day. So, um, so my primer is specific for lithium to silicate. Now let's talk about priming. Why do we prime? Well, priming will strengthen your bond. It'll help seal the area between your cement and your 
substrate. It creates a hydrophobic resin loving surface of your substrate so that resins will be attracted to the crown itself, right? So it creates a hydrophobic surface and it secures the interface. So a primer's function, and this is why you need a clean surface, okay? It attaches to this roughened substrate surface. Uh, and zirconia and lithium desilicate are different. And it creates this resin-loving, hydrophobic surface so that your resins are now attracted to the surface of your zirconia or your lithium desilicate. And this is why I like to use specific uh, primers for specific substrates, right? So, um, so my typical setup in my practice is, this is a zirconia setup, um, is I've got the zirconia crown out. I've got my primer, Z Prime Plus. I've got my bleach to clean out the underside after I try it in, chlorhexidine to clean the tooth, and phosphoric acid also to clean the tooth as well. Okay, now, if I had um, a lithium desilicate crown, I would use just a, the different primer, right? But everything else is, is basically the same. I've got my phosphoric acid to clean the underside. I wouldn't clean it with bleach because it's, 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 um, it's lithium desilicate. Uh, but I would kill, clean it with phosphoric acid. And then I've got chlorhexidine to clean the tooth. And, of course, my cement and my adhesive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the – let's look at a clinical situation for uh, bonding to a tooth substrate for a fully retentive crown. Now – I'm reviewing this because it's a it's a clinical uh, situation, and um, we're going to see a clinical case. But let's just review when we're bonding to the tooth substrate for a fully retentive crown, four to, to ten degrees taper, three to four millimeters wall, strong core. We've got this prep. I'm going to use in this situation a self adhesive cement, Calibra Universal, and if we're using zirconia or lithium desilicate. Really, we just need to understand which primer to use for lithium desilicate. It's a uh, silane. Uh, again, you can get this from Bisco and A and B. And this is a Z Prime Plus. This is another Bisco product, um, and this is specific for zirconia. Both primers, both will help with that sealing and with that strength of your bond. Okay. So. Here's the clin clinical uh, case. We've got a nice retentive crown, beautiful margins. We can see everything visibly. Um, and so we are going to now choose to clean the tooth, right? We've taken the temporary off. We don't have any cement, uh, temporary cement on, right? We are going to clean the tooth either with a uh, phosphoric acid, this is the blue picture, or, and this is an or, this is not an and, right? or we're going to clean it with a chlorhexidine solution. Clinic clinician's choice, I'm showing both examples here because every clinician's different and you can choose to do it any way you want, right? I choose to do it with a phosphoric acid because I will usually use, and, and you know, this is, sometimes we have those cases that are not uh, clear cut. This is a pretty clear cut retentive case, right? Uh, but usually, you know, clinically, we don't usually have clear cut, you know, retentive cases. So 90% of the time, I'll be using um, a dual cure resin cement that will, will require a total etch uh, technique and, um, and then a, an adhesive. So in this situation, we're just using a self-adhesive resin cement, so I can pick either one of these. So then we'll put the self-adhesive self resin cement, well, we'll, we'll prime the substrate, right? We've tried it in, we'll prime it. Um, this is, we're gonna be using a uh, Z Prime Plus. And then we'll go ahead and put our self-adhesive resin cement into the crown, put it on the tooth. Now, on the, at this point, I'll seat the crown, and I'll let it sit there for 20 to 30 seconds, right? Because this is a dual cured resin, right? I want to make sure that the chemistry is going to do its thing. And then I'm going to start uh, tacking that in. And I'll use a five-second tack on the buckle, five-second tack on, on the lingual, and we'll go ahead and clean that off. And this cleans off really, really well, really, really well. So I don't have to worry about a lot of time cleaning, um, 
and I've already adjusted. So basically everything is ready to go. It's a very quick, easy process. All right. So that's a self-adhesive resin cement. Um, remember this with resin cements, adjust the bite at try-in, your major adjustments at try-in, clean the inside of the crown after you try it in. Wait 30 seconds after you seat to tack cure just so that chemistry can, can get going. And then you want to completely light cure after the cleanup. Okay. So it's really important that we do all of these things uh, afterwards and during, and that'll make your life a lot easier. Now we're going to talk about a dual cure total etch resin cement. Uh, I use this a good majority of the time just because I'm a bonding guy and I get great results hardly get any debonds um, because I, I think I'm just pretty meticulous about the way that I do um, my bonding. All right, but be careful. A dual cure um, total etch resin cement is not the same thing as a self-adhesive resin cement. The self-adhesive resin cement has the adhesive in it already. What we need to do here is we need to bond this like we would a composite um, okay, we need to have a either a, I use a prime and bond elect. Uh, so with prime and bond elect, I'll use the um, a total edge technique um, and still use the adhesive. And uh, so that way we can um, we can make sure that we're getting a really good bond. So this is an example of what I do in the clinic. This is a, an example of a of a um, bridge. Um, it's a video and we'll see if this gets going here. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. So it's a total etch, uh, and it, it's a little bit uh, of a lot here. I, I, I should have just probably shown a single unit, but this is a bridge. It's the same thing as what you would be doing in your office. Um, and so we're taking off the temporary and we're going to clean everything up here, but you're going to see, uh, how we clean it all up and the temporary and the tissue looks really good. We don't have any bleeding or any problems with that. Um, so again, we're just taking off the temporary. And you can see that everything comes off very clean, very easy. Tissue looks good. Temporary looks good. Now we're going to clean the preparation chlorhexidine rinse. And we're going to try it in. And we're going to check the bite. And just adjust the bite now if we need to. Again, we can take it in and out and do all of the adjustments as, as we need to normally would. We've already checked the margins. Everything looks really good here. We're going to now, after we've adjusted, we're going to clean. This is a bleach uh, that we're just going to clean. We're going to rinse and then we're going to dry it. Good. And we're going to make sure that everything is dry and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to prime it. This is Z prime plus. And we're going to just blow that gently. You can see how I, I want to make sure that that primer gets into all of the cleaned areas of the bridge of the restoration. Make sure that it's dry. It'll be a little bit glossy. Now we're going to clean the tooth. Uh, we're going to etch it. And this is very quick. We, we don't want to leave that etch on too much. Uh, too much etch will uh, cause a decrease in bond strength as well. So my assistant knows the minute I put that on, it's going to come right off. And we're not going to leave that on for any amount of time. And then we're going to use Prime and Bond Elect. Again, notice how everything is clean. Everything is clear. No bleeding. No uh, saliva. Prime and Bond Elect. We'll go ahead and light cure that and now we're ready to put the resin into the um, restoration 
very easy. And we'll go ahead and seat the crown. And again, this is very easy. Anyone can do this uh, clinically if you're controlling the clinical situation. We want to make sure that we fill that up enough to where we can see that fill the micro gap and look at that uh, material extrude through all of the um, margin. I want to make sure we get all of that out. Again, we're pressing and holding and then for about 20 seconds and then we're going to tack and we're going to clean that up and you can, you'll can you see how easy it is to clean this material. We're not spending a lot of time on it because it will break free from that margin, making sure that that material stays in that micro gap. That's the beauty of do, using a resin cement is that you don't have to really worry about that resin staying in the micro gap because it's already bonded in place. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a wonderful situation. So, um, that's the way that I use a dual cured resin cement, um, total etch. And, um, and that concludes our program. And I'm so hopeful that someone Ed, that you all took at least one pearl from this lecture um, and that you can use something and that it will be helpful for you. If you have any questions, um, please contact me with my contact device you can see on the, on the screen. Um, but uh, continue to be great and amazing. And I really appreciated being with you here today and talking to you about the new rules of indirect restorations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Simos, for joining tonight and for the great presentation. Really appreciate that. Um, we're now going to open up the Q&A session. So as a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the box labeled have a question on your screen. Um, one of the questions we've been getting is, to, is for us to send the recording link. The recording will be sent out sometime in the next week. So yes, this webinar was recorded and we will send out that link within a week. Another question asks, how long do you scrub their zirconia with bleach? That's a great question. Really, you don't need to scrub it too long. You just need to um, get that bleach in contact with the surface of the zirconia and then rinse it out really, really well. So once you put it in and have contact with the, with the intaglia of the zirconia, you're in good shape. All right, great. Our next question is from Michael, who asks, are you able to use bleach instead of Ibuclean? And if so, um, why? Um, you can't. You can use the bleach instead of IvoClean, um, and the reason is it's because bleach is the only other thing that's been shown to clean the micropores of the zirconia. So that's really what you're trying to do. You can either use IvoClean, you can use bleach, or you can sandblast, and that will do the same thing. So, um, so yes. Um, the research all shows that, that bleach uh, is the only other thing that will clean the micropores of the zirconia. Thank you, doctor. Um, our next question asks, what type of temporary cement do you use and what is your preferred method of cleaning it? Uh -huh. Okay, this is an interesting question and I'm going to kind of go a little bit off label here because personally, I don't use um, temporary cement. I use uh, a flowable composite. I used to use a drop of flowable composite in my uh, temporaries, and then I, I put it down, and I really don't have any excess. I don't have any sensitivity. Uh, and when I go to take it off, I either cut the temporary off or I can just flip it up with, a, um, with, with an instrument. So it's really easy, no stress, no hassles. Um, uh, so that's that's what I use, and so I'm sorry I can't be much help with that. All right, thank you. And um, our next question asks: Do you air thin your bonding resin before light curing? Absolutely. Um, I think it's imperative that you thin it as much as you can. I blow the heck out of it because um, you have to. What are you doing when you're when you're blowing that? adhesive you're 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 actually um, getting rid of the carriers that is in the adhesive and you're also thinning it so you're creating a better bond um, so absolutely you want to thin that no puddles no anything like that you want to thin that adhesive as much as possible all right I 
think that wraps up our uh, Q&A session for tonight. So thank you, Dr. Simos, for oh, joining you. us to answer these questions. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, great questions and all things that uh, need to be considered. So thank you for having me. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, we did record tonight's webinar, like I mentioned, and we will email the recording out sometime in the next week. So be on the lookout for that. And we also would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Simos. And we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you.